it's a nice target to shoot for, but I think what we really have is this big compensation puzzle, and we got to try to guess the best way. So if you have a discosaur with scoliosis and lumbar, leave it alone. They need it. You, know, you have a javelin thrower, and the, the fascial matrix on the front is kind of loose, probably too compliant. Do you really want to play with that? All right, athletes are good, are of good faith, but there's a lot of brokenness in many life realms. You know, I believe that all athletes are good people and want to be better at the core, especially if they keep coming back. Some coaches think athletes are bad and it's their job to drive bad out of them or to control them or whatnot. But my belief is they come in good faith, but there's a lot of brokenness in the heart, soul, mind, and spirit through bad coaching, failed performances, life issues, partner issues, whatever. Aberrations may aid health and performance. So just like I was talking about, scoliosis or Greg being pigeon toed and bow legged. Every pigeon toed bow legged guy I've ever had is a fascial genius and they can run fast and jump. Are we going to affect that? We can to some degree, but that's part of what makes him good. Athletes are uniquely gifted and those gifts can sometimes have <coughs> curses. So like Goldie's big in range person, it's great when she lines it up, but if she's a little bit off, it's going to be an injury. Uh, Dwayne Chambers is incredibly powerful, but when he gets in trouble with presses or he's not comfortable, that power becomes an enemy. He ends up staying on the ground too long. So the 60 meters, he can run the bolt every 10 meter segment. After 60, he's nowhere near bolt. Why? Because his greatest gift, power production, becomes his worst enemy. A uh, coach has to reprove himself daily. I truly believe that. For young coaches, just get used to it. Like Johnny Peacock questions everything I do. Every day. You do. So I think it's normal that no matter what you've done, how many you've done it with or whatever, Athletes come and say, I'm unique. They come with a certain degree of narcissism, and they're like, are you sure this is right for me? You know, like, Gandhi could tell her to wash with this water, and she'd have five questions. Uh, fear is real. Can aid or fail performance. I don't fear fear, but I fear uncontrolled fear. I think a little bit of fear is a good thing. Uh, this is a tough, fear is a tough puzzle for me. The, the getting it right, is it a, enough? Is it too much? Am I feeding it? Because you can think you're being a positive coach and you're doing possible mobile inputs, but you're creating the fear. Because if they want linear like a Reese, a Rob Reese, if they want it linear and you're coming at it multi-directional, you're feeding his fear. Training groups and integrated support teams are essential. It's just time and time again when I look at people that do it consistently over time, multiple times, they have that. Athletes must become students at an event. I don't think robots make it to the top. You know, tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do. Give me the answer or give me the magic program. I think if they're not PhD students at their event, I don't have much time for them. And I realize that may take a few years to light that fire, but if I don't see that fire growing, then I don't have much time. Coach and athlete have an open relationship and by open, I mean all things are fair. And I think a lot of kids in the UK have trouble with this open relationships with coaches or performance staff. I think a lot of our people still are struggling 
with unconditional love and respect. I think it's probably the one of the underlying viruses we still have going on in our group. Athletes must take ownership of their journey, so I push people pretty hard to become pretty independent pretty fast. KPIs are real and underanalyzed, I think, in a lot of instances. Like, I don't think a lot of athletes or performance people sit down and say, what are the world's best doing? Where are you at? What's standard practice? What's the goal of practice? You know, like, we were doing PRP 13 years ago in Toronto. In the UK, it's four or five years of accepted practice. So I think we have some ideas and inputs and experiences with PRP that supersede where the current trend is. So is there a KPI in the utilization of PRP and other agents in that agency? Yes. Training gaps are not understood or appreciated by support staffs, in my opinion. NFL, NBA, whatever, they don't understand how this gap grows and what this does psychologically and physiologically to the athlete. Best form of training is done doing event specific work. If you want to get better at sprinting, you sprint. If you want to get better at pole vaulting, you pole vault. You don't do five hours of gymnastics. My level should be getting a lot better from my weekly level. Okay. The best form of event specific training is competing. I think our people under compete and I think they compete at too low a level of urgency too many times. Carl Lewis said something when he was about 22 years old that really stuck with me. He says, Coach T will not look, put me on the track if I'm not ready to run right at my PR. So I don't go on the track unless he tells me. And if you look at Carl's record as a 100 meter sprinter, a long jumper, he didn't mail it in. I had a long talk with Edwin Moses who had one of the longest streaks ever and he said, I was hurt, I was sick or whatever, I had this injury or what, but he said, once I walked through the gate and got in the blocks, I was going for it. I don't think our people are there yet. So I think they undercompete, or if they compete enough to get us off their back, they compete with less urgency than they need to. I think our group still thinks that they show up at the big show and magic happens. How does that fit in with your um, the perceptual grid? That we put, you know, like. The vendors you wear different times of year. Yeah. So you can still be urgent even though what you're hitting at. So you're clear about your targets even though it might be better. Or you yeah. might be it's it. just like this fall's training has urgency. Yeah. Last year, it had no urgency. There's five or six components to each one of these people that we can say they've upgraded tenfold from last fall. So we got the urgency and training in this phase of the year. Now let's see if it carries on into the competitions. Competitions train many, many items and systems. I think a lot of people treat competition as something out there. Like it's something you go do and you come back and that didn't have any effect on you. So we can train right away on Monday or those psychological wounds you encountered are gone, that was a meet, now we're in practice. Um, competitions are huge stress, they're final exams. And transference of training is critical. I don't believe in doing something three generations removed from the event itself. So pole vault gymnastics, I think it's a waste of time. Because Steve Lewis is running 95 meters per second. He plants the pole, it bends in multiple directions, and it's moving at four meters per second to the vertical axis. There's no gymnastics exercise or apparatus you can build that will replicate that. 
my experience with people really good in the gymnastics room is they're terrible on the pole. It's false security. So doing 15 hours of hurdle walkovers isn't going to make you a better hurdler. Might make you a little more mobile, a little more posturally aware, but it doesn't transfer. I don't believe in a lot of drills because I don't see drills transfer. I'm somewhat hesitant to even use classic part hole training because again you get caught in those gaps. Some people pull part hole work. Some people, if you go part hole, they never see a holistic picture. Mm -hmm. So to me, the, when you write training or you're looking at training, the transference has to be a huge overriding motif to what you write. So in 27 minutes, that's how I.